welcome to another edition of Asian Founders and Funders, where we interview entrepreneurs from every field and those who provide funding for them. I'm Mark Kramer, Senior Lecturer of Entrepreneurship at Vin University and host of the show. Today's guest is entrepreneur, consultant, and writer Jen Vong, author of The Leadership Development Journey. Welcome, Jen. Hello, Mark. Thank you for having me. We normally say good morning from Vietnam because we love everyone to feel the sense of having a new thought or a new contact or a new partnership either in Vietnam or in the global scale. And Mark has been a friend, a mentor of the ecosystem in Vietnam. Thanks for your entrepreneurship, mentorship and spirit. I so love Vietnam. It has been like the best experience I've ever had. And the people are amazing. And the country is highly underrated. But I see in The Economist that they're predicting that uh, Vietnam will have the fastest economic growth in all of Asia over the next 10 years. So I'm excited about that for uh, Vietnam. And so let's talk about you. Tell us first about your professional background. Thank you, Mark. And uh, yes, Vietnam is a place to live. So I hope you and more friends who are listening to it right now can actually see the connection of what you have been doing with Vietnam or with Mark or with someone that we have in our network. And for myself, I think it has been always people focused and uh, everything I have been doing, I think it is linking with people uh, and the background was really related to my journey as a uh, very silent person almost for 20 years from uh, a countryside and uh, I turned to be more like outgoing person and uh, even using speaking training and coaching as part of my career and I also made a transformation from an engineer electronics and telecommunication engineer working for Samsung and Dell partner, now more than on people side. And over the journey of transforming myself, I have identified working with people as my very main focus of all the things that I am doing and I will be doing. So why did you decide to leave the safety of a large company like Samsung and become an entrepreneur, uh, consultant, coach, and author? It was a really like an um, awareness development journey. Maybe people call like identifying your calling or your purpose or your passion in life. And then you really know what to do next. And you listen to your intuition to make that decision. And it, it was really, really like that for me. I really... But I was so passionate on learning about why people are doing what they're doing when I was a kid because I was very silent. And the reason I was silent, it had a lot to do with normally people would say that I would not do things because I was a kid coming from the countryside and I was a girl. I could not study in the technology or engineering field. And then I turn to be very silent, to listen and observe all the things around me. And that actually helped me to understand my thoughts and what I wanted and what truly mattered. And I identified at that time as a kid that I wanted to really make the sound impossible thing become possible and really live in the way that I feel the most meaningful way. And I had a some kind of accidents in when I was a kid. So that really helped me to identify what, what actually the meaning of life. Uh, so it was a big question, I think, for many people. For me, because of these accidents almost got kidnapped or almost uh, died because of a serious accident or almost you know, drowned in the river, it made me feel like I had to leave in the way that I would feel prouder when I ended my life. And so that's why I was on the search to really identify what was that way for me to actualize my desire to live the life that is meaningful. And on the way of searching or identifying the how 
the way of actualizing the why I found my passion in working with people. And uh, that was the moment when I actually started my community business. And um, I helped other people to be confident and to be able to connect with others. And that was the moment I felt I could do it in the rest of my life, helping other people to really believe in, in what they actually had inside them and to connect with others. And that was the time where I got the better chance to be a staff trainer in Samsung or in the company I worked when I was in Malaysia, even I was an engineer. So at that moment, I reinforced my passion in working with people. So I knew that I had to do something about it. I had to transition to work in that people field even more. Uh, so working with the machine, mobiles, and computers were great. But then shifting to have more kind of time to work with people. And that was why I left the engineering career. So uh, why did you write this book? I, I was telling my story to many friends when I was born and how did I find what I call purpose and my passion. And I was talking about my brothers and sisters. How did they help me in my early life? And then they said, why don't you just put in books so more people can know about these great stories. And then I started seeing it as a method to actually spread the messages and the values that I believe. Uh, so that's why I started put it into books. But for writing, writing has been a part of my life because I remember I was a kid and I didn't get on well with my eldest sisters. And then uh, there was a moment where I went to see her in where she was normally writing. And then I didn't want to touch her when I didn't like her, but I saw a page, a page of the writing and then I would see some words that I thought I would never imagine it would come from her, the person that I didn't like. It were about love, caring, and compassion, and worrying about my naughtiness. So I totally shifted how I see my sister at that time. And then uh, my relationship with my sister changed. And I found a piece of writing could actually really transform somebody's perspective. And I started writing a scene then. And later on, I just make the writing habit daily become the writing in a form of the book. And it, it, in the book, I was wondering, and, and the book is great. And there's so much research you've done. I mean, I think it's one of the most researched books I've ever, uh, I've ever read. What's your definition of leadership? Thank you, Mark, because actually you was asking particularly on the book named The Leadership Development Journey. And that was a research-based book. And all of my books actually also qualitative or quantitative-based research books. And uh, the journey of all the books actually linked together, starting from I identified my purpose and then my passion and then the goals help me to break down the journey so I can have different milestones to actualize the purpose and execute the passion. And then another book is actually the one that Mark just mentioned, named The Leadership Development Journey. That was when I finished my second master degree and it was a test that I worked with one of the top leadership researcher in the UK. And um, that book, I actually combined the learning from entrepreneurs in Asia and in European countries and in Western countries too, like uh, the US. Uh, so uh, the definition of leadership, I think on that book, uh, it was a aha moment when I, I was in the class, leadership class and the leadership professor came in and his energy and his vibe, his whatever you call like, 
the, the way he show up, it was so like profound for me at that time. I never had that feeling before, the peace, the professionalism, the, the compassion and the, the wisdom. And when he appeared, he just said one sentence that made me feel this is how I would define leadership. He said, leadership is everything we do in life. And for sure, before asking that, he already made the demonstration of what was leadership on that, uh, in that sense. He asked every one of us in that room to hear us first. So when every one of us already spoke out, he started sharing how did he see that. So I learned the way he behaved, the way he lived. And I think uh, that is a great demonstration of leadership. It is really the way of life. So you mentioned the book, What Differentiates Leaders from Entrepreneurial Leaders is Risk-Taking. Can you talk more about that? Can you share that uh, again? Yeah. Uh, yes, I was asking, you mentioned the book, What Differentiate Leaders from Entrepreneurial Leaders, you know, regular business leaders from entrepreneurial leaders is risk-taking. So can you talk more about that, the, di uh, the difference in leaders who might be leading an established company compared to entrepreneurs who start um, businesses from scratch and their ability or a willingness to take risk? I love it. I, I love that question. Actually, I don't even like uh, really remember like clearly about that uh, differentiation because that book was quite long ago, but I, I could recall that by linking it to a, what we have been doing right now where we are emerging a lot in the entrepreneurship and, and startup spirit and activities. So I would actually feel like when I I know about that the term of entrepreneurial leaders and actually my professor at that time helped me a lot to name it, to get conceptualize it because I, I would only describe the content behind it but then I didn't really know how to name it. So for me at that moment, and I would share about me right now, what do you think? At that moment, I had the feeling where I lived in a countryside and a country like Vietnam, and I worked in a corporate like Samsung and Dell partner. And, and I also like worked with a lot of kind of people in the traditional ways uh, where I actually felt that that kind of leadership is very like connected with or corporates and uh, it's somehow hierarchy, somehow it has a position and authorities in it. And uh, later on, when I actually went to the UK and I had a year emerging in the startup environment mm -hmm. and I could see no boundaries and I could see the hunger, I could see the uh, risk taking, I could see the uh, fail to stand up. And this mentality made me really see the the kind of different angles of the leadership. And that's how I went to as a professor to name it. And it, it turned out there's a term entrepreneurial leadership where actually the, the entrepreneurship spirit inject in that leaders. So that leaders had that entrepreneurship spirit visit by risk-taking, by allowing mistakes and then allowing completing and then perfecting instead of only perfecting and allowing to work with other people other than working by themselves and also really like be open to learning and never stop learning and uh, working with people based on values added but not on the position and one more important thing is to create other people on that journey so I think that the time that was how I saw that and for now I would actually see like the entrepreneur leader is really somebody who really like also have these elements. But I, I get it. It's like now they they don't really need to be different from the normal leadership, but uh, it, it can be like a harmonized. And uh, I think I, I like now to look at the leadership and entrepreneur leadership in the way of how they actually create and empower other people. So that 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 how I would actually see it now. It it means that it's really to create the 
environment for other people can be also the entrepreneur themselves uh, inside that business and then later on can be the leader themselves in that business so yeah that's so, how i would see it now so from your leadership is there one right way to lead and what are the traits of a leader so is there one way of leading that everybody should follow or are there many different ways of leading and what are the traits of a leader I actually, I, I really have a hard time to answer this one. And I know that in the book that uh, we have a, like a list of theories listing all the traits of lead, leaders. And uh, I myself, I I remember my Facebook, actually, I put it Gen Empower Leaders. And uh, I think I was upset on this topic as nature of me trying to really live my life take control of my own life and be the owner of my life, lead my life. Mm -hmm. And this is the starting point of me seeing and developing and learning about leadership. So I would see there's a lot of things, but maybe the, one of the fundamentals would be that person has to be their own leader and they have to lead themselves. And then another part of that later on will be they can create other people to do the same. Okay. But the, in their own way, not in the way that they, they do, but in the way that other people do. So they can be the leader of themselves and create other people who can lead the life and uh, can create the great things in the way that best for them, not for the leader. So yeah. So, so uh, in the book, you mentioned about many leadership styles, such as transformational, contingency, contingency distributed, and many others. Is there one right way right now to use in 2024? Like, you know, um, leadership has changed over the past, you know, thousand years. I mean, yeah. there, at, at different times, there are different types of styles that work best. So right now in 2024, and you write in the book about these different styles, transformational, contingency, and distributed, what works best in 2024? Yeah, lovely. That that book was launched in uh, 2017, 18. I, I guess it's like we all almost now 2024. So uh, we know that is five years or seven years ago totally different thing, right? But I, I would say that it really comes back to the fundamental of human and so being. So uh, I may speak from that aspect and I combine it with the 2024 and years move to move forward. And if I had to choose one thing, I, I would uh, I just say it around. It, it's really about people focus and uh, maybe if we want to talk about the two, it would be co-creation as a mentality. Yeah, so I, I really appreciate that uh, co-creation. I believe that people create what they, people will support what you create. Uh, so as a leader, you want people to to be the best of themselves and want to have them to participate in what you do in the share call, calling or go. Then co-creation would be my keyword. So you write about the debate between psychological U.S. centric and sociological European. Where does Asia fall into this debate? Wow, maybe probably you're gonna know better than me by uh, being a really like objective person. What do you think? Uh, I I I don't know what to think about it. Um, as I've been here almost a year and I've observed a lot and learned a lot, but I um, I. I think that I would struggle to answer that question because I haven't been as much, haven't been here as long as you have, and you've also worked in other environments. Mm. So, what's your yeah, take I think on maybe this? We go, yeah, maybe we go to the the meaning of really categorize it, right? What, what would be the meaning of it? Maybe the benefit is to really to to then see that how the practicality involves with the research and science, and then we can actually have more materials to get updated and can learn from each other. Actually, I normally go on the way where I think uh, what is the thing that matters here is 
but not on really the way of categorizing it. Uh, so I think maybe for Vietnam, I would feel that I would use another term, right? It's, it's more about like position leadership and uh, maybe we are still on the way to upgrading it to really go into the part where we can mm, work on the leadership where with more dynamic and more kind of situational and more people focused. Uh, so I, I would look at these elements rather than on the debating of the uh, European and also the, um, the US. Yeah. Okay. And so um, right now, do cultures influence leadership styles such as the American being different than Vietnamese? Because like in America, uh, we're very individualistic. But I noticed here, and in a very good way, uh, Vietnamese and many and most of Asian culture is more group focused than individual focused. Do cultures really influence leaders and how they and how they manage people? I just think like if we look at from the cultural perspective, of for sure that culture has been always an element because it actually influences on the belief, the habitual thinking, the habitual behaviors of human beings. Uh, so uh, I don't know what, what you notice about Vietnam. One of the things I think you talked about was you saw that Vietnamese women seem to be more curious and more kind of entrepreneurial because they, they were like more eager to learn and work with other people, like especially foreign expert like you. So I, I would see like, maybe you actually go back a deeper level on how it, culture actually influenced that, that you have observed. It probably because of the, the somehow I understand, like- mm. I understand in Vietnam from talking to people here that the war put women on an e equal footing because women so um, served in combat positions and women uh, rose up and there are women four-star generals in the army mm -hmm. And not just women who manage other women, but women who are in special forces in every aspect of the military. And uh, you and I met at a National University of Singapore event that you were the keynote speaker and the moderator mm -hmm. for uh, some panels. And 80% of the women, 80% of the entrepreneurs in that room that day, and it wasn't focused on women, but we're all women. And Vietnam is known even in other Asian countries as having a very strong uh, women leadership culture. Well, why why is that? Okay, it's very interesting to actually also mention that in the book, if somewhere we actually talk about women leadership has a advantage of that. And there's a lot of study have shown that women leadership sometimes actually has advantages over the men leaderships in some position to nurture the kind of people in the companies. But I, actually, I, I feel more, I thought about gender, but I, I really believe about human in general. But for um, the job situation, I would see uh, actually like, if you look at all the big positions in Vietnam, we don't see many women. So maybe the women leadership that you mentioned or entrepreneurship, as you mentioned, is it really comes from the eager to learn and maybe because they actually has to really make them feel that they can do it and make them feel like they they are good and they have ability because maybe they get underestimated or maybe because of the society has not really appreciated women enough on the leadership position in organizations so women find ways to actually demonstrate and exercise that potential so I would see is is why you can see a lot of women out there in Vietnam go to learn uh, in programs and upgrade their life. But actually talking about in general, in the high position in the government, you don't see a lot of women. Uh, so I, I would see the one of the key elements is the eager to learn and to really exercise what they believe they can do. Maybe because it comes from the limiting environment where they didn't get opposited enough, or maybe because they got the encouragement and say they go to learn and even upgrade themselves more. 
Uh, how does someone discover their own leadership style? I think self-awareness is, is a door. I, I always feel like this is one of the very often talked a sentence, self-awareness as a door for really somebody identify what would be my most suitable and best version of myself as a leader. And actually it will be involving all the life of that person. For myself, for example, I believe that I I would see different kind of elements of myself as a person because my self-awareness just change over time. Uh, so uh, I, I used to feel like uh, in a certain way where I would always would make people challenge themselves and really like make the impossible become possible. And it, it was that kind of very long period of my journey. And uh, slowly I shifted that leadership style into more like co-creating and uh, that would involving more of the compassion in there and the the nurturing. So uh, I feel like the involvement of leadership comes with the involvement of self-awareness and the development of that person in the mindset, capability, and skill set. Yeah. Uh, how important is it uh, for a company to have a mission and vision statement? And should it come only from the CEO or should it be a company-wide effort? Lovely. Uh, I think that's the question. It's really to demonstrate on the point of the previous question uh, where you talk about what is the chance of the leaders for 2024. And I, I would see like the co-creation is the one that I, I love to continue practicing. And I, I would see like it will really want to to sustain and to see the kind of environment where we want to go to work. We want people to co-create that because they co-create that. They feel they are a part of that and they are part of the values that they provide. They are part of the culture that they create. So they they actually have more feeling and emotion and engagement. So uh, I, I feel the co-creation is a key either in creating the mission, vision, or in creating the culture. I understand for each stage of the business, maybe we will have the level of co-creation differently, but we actually can do it even you are with one or two people or with many people, you can still apply that. Uh, one of the critical issues you mentioned is that sustaining entrepreneurial leadership for value creation necessitates ethical action to build legitimacy. What are you talking about here? Wow, that sounds like a very, uh, <laughs> really big sentence. I, I feel like maybe we break it down into the, um, the ethics and the sustainability. Could we do that? Yes, of course. Yeah. I just think like ethical here is a topic like it's big in leadership and it's still going to continue like going on no matter how the society involved. And uh, I would see it, it comes to the ethical aspect of a person that they are ethic to themselves as a person. So they, they actually act upon their potential. They don't act under their potential and uh, they keep the integrity and uh, they do what they say they believe and they, they align their values their action and all the things so they had to be very ethical to themselves and I think that would be like the foundation for them to be ethical with anything they do with other people and if in a business we promote that in every single person we can actually create that ethical environment in whatever we do and the services or the products that we provide. And that for sure links to the sustainability. Uh, but uh, we also understand it means that the results in the short term may not be the very uh, strong point of this approach. But I think in the long run, if we don't really take care of that ethicality to ourselves and others and uh, the sustainability to ourselves and others and to life, to the environment, then we will see there's some kind of consequences happen. Um, you write about uh, the differences between entrepreneurial small businesses with maybe 50 people or less and larger organization, big businesses with 100 people or more. 
how are those businesses different? What's how the culture is different? What's the feel? How how's it different? Yeah, I just remember a story uh, from that a study where um, there was a leader talking about he or she could not sleep because their employees had problems, right? So uh, that was like the moment when they have around one or two or three or four, five employees. And uh, it was how actually they started their leadership journey. And then when it got to 50 people, they started knowing that they had to let go some kind of, you know, close relationship and uh, taking care of others in that way. So I, I feel like I would see that the differences about the number of people in the business will lead us to the differences of how the leaders have to involve their mindset, their capability, their skill set, and the way they deal with the employees, the people in their businesses. Uh, so I, I think it comes back to, again on the awareness of that leader, what actually the business means to them and uh, what, what is their goal in there, whether they want to only focus on that practicality of the finance or they actually want to build a place where they want to go to work, everyone wants to go to work. And then they, they're they going to go from that ending mind to actually design how they structure the business, how they structure their leadership. And uh, they can actually like work with themselves and one or two or three more people around them. And they can actually duplicate that model to other people when the business grows. Uh, so it means that they, the more the business grows, if they care about people, they can build other leaders so the other leader can build other people. So it is how they actually can make the culture consistent, but still ensure the core values they believe when uh, they do the business. Yeah. So I think it's about people really, like how actually you want to to do with people and create the culture and the business around people with the small number and big number. If you want to care about every single person, you still can have habit to do that. Even you have 100 different employees, you can still schedule like once a week, randomly people can come to talk to you. Before that, maybe you can talk to everyone if you had three people. But if you want to keep that culture, you, you do it with random employee, that normally not working with you, but you make the leaders who are the leaders of them to do that. Uh, so I think it's always coming back to that spirit that people want to build and then they break it down into habits to execute that, no matter how big or small the business is. Uh, do you re recommend aspiring leaders read articles and books on psychology? Because you seem to read a lot about that. I think everyone has different styles to really evolve themselves as a person, as a leader or entrepreneur. And uh, it may come back to the self-awareness part because that would really help that person to, to know what is really the most suitable way for them. And maybe uh, to get to the self-awareness part, we have some habits that you can build to be open to learning. And uh, maybe we don't know what is the best ways for us reading or listening or going to work with other people we just do it all and then we will reflect upon it what would be the best way for us and i think the the one idea would maybe more fundamental is to really asking what what is the, the things that matter and if the things that matter require us reading and learning or listening we we will do it because it's a secondary the thing that matter matters the most yeah um, in the book, you mentioned how social factors can influence leadership development. Uh, please explain this. And if you want to develop leadership skills, what should you do? Like you don't have leadership skills, uh, but you want to develop them because you feel like in order to take your idea and, and uh, commercialize it, you need to be able to lead people, but you've never been that before. So um how does that how do you develop those leadership skills and how does um social interaction uh improve that lovely i normally say it's a self development in a social development process and i believe that we always learn more about ourselves and others and life 
the two our cell development and social development. We will not develop ourselves only by ourselves. So uh, if we need to break it down in the way, like I remember there was a story of a, a person who actually achieved the program in the UK. Uh, actually the time was I was there to study under the UK government program and scholarship. So that person actually had to go through a, an interview where they asked about the leadership the skills, as you mentioned, they asked, like, have you had any experiences to show your leadership skills and potential? And that guy, actually, he was an engineer, and I was also an engineer, but I had done different kind of projects. But he answered in this way. He said he didn't really lead anyone, but he actually led himself. <laughs> and uh, he said that he would actually have the potential to lead on work with other people. So he would love to take this chance to do that. So I, I was like thinking back on what I shared before that actually it has to really come from ourselves. So that that is a very like very foundation step. But putting it in the social circle, it means that maybe we can do it through doing a project with a team member where we have three or four or five people working with us, or we can actually go to a network, uh, a community. I met Mark, uh, thank you, Mark, to come to my community. And that is where we can learn how to connect with other people. And maybe ideas come and we can start jumping in to work with somebody. So I, I think it's really a journey, like every day asking ourselves, how can we be better at skill and mindset in what we do? And then asking ourselves, what actually we can work with the person in where we're working better and then find identify particular project or particular maybe idea business idea to execute on and uh, maybe think about it as a what we call like a leadership program and uh, invest in time and effort to learn and develop ourselves i even actually really enjoy the idea where one of my friends there recommended that just hire someone and work with them and develop your leadership and think about it as a fee of the MBA or leadership program. And that's also another idea, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I worked with a world famous entrepreneur named Dr. Hubert Schumacher, who built a company called Senecor. Uh, and sold it for over $4.2 billion to Johnson & Johnson back in the 90s. And he used to have me spend a minimum of a half a day every Friday just thinking. No phone, no meetings, no nothing. How much time a day, a week, or a month do you encourage entrepreneurs to spend on just reflecting and thinking? I would feel like it, it can be even happening in every moment. Like what we are doing right now, I actually learn a lot from what I said. So I would feel like uh, when we do it, it's become automat automatically, like in second and in moment. And um, it's not about we get distracted, but it's, it's really like it come together. Like we can actually realize something when we say. Uh, so uh, maybe schedule every week, every, every month, long one. I would say the last Friday of the last week, of a month and uh, probably you can just get out of where normally you stay or get to the area with nature, with water, uh, with mountains and do that like one long day break down in a month uh, with nature. I even saw some companies they actually have meeting in uh, the jack and in the field, which is awesome because nature actually can trigger a lot of, uh, you know, the kind of a limited feeling and also getting to the high frequency of energy, of creativity and possibilities. So uh, that is for every month, for every week, I would say like half of, half of the day would be nice. If you can do one day, also great. Half of the day, get out of what you normally do and deeply writing, that's I like, and not really engaging with other things or maybe just do even nothing and uh, let your sleep on it and you can get back on it the next days. I, I know some people, they actually will do like a long sleep for a week and this is how they actually take breaks. And then the 
But normally these people, they actually really disciplined. We're not talking about people normally sleep a lot every day and have another half a day to do that. And another habit to reflect on the daily. I really love that every evening before we go to sleep, we actually can close the day by knowing we did well and we would improve on something, but saying to ourselves, okay, the day finished and uh, we let it finish, let it take a rest and we do it too. And then uh, in set the intention of feeling grateful uh, before I go to bed. And I, I would see that is another very important time where we will not go to sleep constantly, but our subconscious mind still working. So this is a great time to implement or to plant the seed of gratitude possibilities for the subconscious mind. And then every kind of activity during the day, I would feel like our team goes like finish strong, which means that you spend like three minutes right after the meeting to just do the first activity needed. And um, I, I just think like, for example, our conversation today after this particular interview, I know Mark will right away to grab up something. I call it like a habit of reflection and finish strong. And so I, I would see this could be like the habit of the month, the habit of the week, the day, and activity. And yeah, for sure, New Year. I, I love New Year. If you want to talk about the whole year reflection, I think spend five days or three days or even a week if you need to do the whole year cleaning, auditing, and New Year prepare, preparation. I think it's so worth it doing it. Um, what do you think, and you do a lot of coaching and you work with entrepreneurs all the time, what do entrepreneurs waste too much time on? I, I just recently uh, see a lot of statistics about at least an hour wasted on scrolling up and down. I, I'm not talking about phone or laptop or anything, but anything scrolling up and down, uh, like normally people spend uh, at least an hour wasted on that for no reason but like a habit uh, so uh, I believe that entrepreneurs somehow they have like let's say calling mission passion which is awesome so they can work on this but somehow that habit of scrolling up and down is happening maybe now like you, you don't even know like how long does it take for you one hour per day it means that seven hours per week and then it, it like how many hours per month? It means that you lose different days in a month. And for entrepreneur, time is like, wow. Uh, so I, I would say that the scrolling up and down, the, um, the worrying about we don't finish it yet because entrepreneurs always want to get things done. And uh, sometimes scrolling up and down also as a way to, to really peace, the feeling of not completing or waiting or worrying. So I really think that the awareness of writing down or noticing any moment of emotion arise and you do in the activity like scrolling up and down or could not sleep, you, you can acknowledge it and you can actually quantify it to see many hours that wasted and then you, you you ask yourself one activity to replace it. Uh, so uh, I think for, for that awareness and um, the scoring up and down, I think the main thing, but the, the main reason of that is the feeling, the anxiety or the worries. That is where all the kind of wasting time come from. Yeah. So we, we need to identify that uh, and capture that patterns and the solution to, to replace and retell that story. Um, when making decisions, you write about it, different processes and methods. What do you do when you're making this hard decisions? How, what's your process for thinking these things through? I really like the way of looking at decision making uh, in uh, this kind of concept, uh, choosing the difficult path. Uh, so, uh, uh, it will have about five different options. And then uh, we know that one option is the most difficult one. And uh, it is difficult, but it, it is worthy and it's important in the long run. So I I would see if we need to 
to choose, we need to choose a difficult path. If it's worthy and it is also like important. Uh, and uh, the another way to make a decision, I, I think it, it comes from more like uh, small decision that or we call it like small choices daily. I think sometimes it, it comes with the intuition. So uh, how can we actually make this based on intuition, even for the important decision? I think it is coming from the self-awareness again. So the more we are aware of our true values, our self, and honest with that, the more we can actually tune into the intuition. And the intuition, or some people call it whispers, actually just made us feel right or wrong when we do that. So uh, I really enjoy actually maximize the power of making decisions based on intuition. Yeah. Uh, you work with many entrepreneurs uh, uh, throughout Vietnam and I guess outside of Vietnam as well. And you run a uh, you run events to help entrepreneurs raise capital. What industries and opportunities do you see on the rise in Vietnam? For uh, any friend who is listening to it right now, or uh, you mean for entrepreneurs in Vietnam, uh, maybe I can break it down in different aspects. Uh, so I, I would see like Vietnam, for any friends outside of Vietnam who are listening to it right now, it's really the place to come. And if you have been here, coming back. Uh, so actually, I and my friend even talk about like, Vietnam, who knows? So, because actually, uh, when uh, he came for, to Vietnam, uh, he also from the US, and he, all, he, he would actually feel that what he knew about Vietnam, only 5%, what actually he would experience. So opportunities in Vietnam, firstly, because I think comes back to people. People actually, we are in, in the country where we have a lot of young people, and more and more people actually are educated by foreign system, but they still are Vietnamese. So uh, I see a lot of them coming back and doing something about uh, contributing to the country, and and that that actually create the movement and the openness and the the possibilities of the youth, and that's how actually. It's a door for foreigners to come and to be able to be to work with people by working with these very young, enthusiastic entrepreneurs and leaders who have been educated in other countries and or maybe in the very dynamic universities in Vietnam. And the second thing, I think is is really the time where the government and everyone actually talks about entrepreneurship, startup innovation. So we actually can maximize the power of the whole system when we come to Vietnam. And I also think like having the people like Mark, foreign expert who come to Vietnam and who has figured out something. And if, if you come to Vietnam, you can connect with people like Mark. I think it, it already like shorten half of the, the things that you are going to concern about. Uh, so, uh, this means that the important of the ecosystem, the collaboration in different angles, or maybe meeting uh, our team in what we're doing here in Vietnam, uh, the local partner would be the way for you to open up the opportunities in Vietnam. And uh, for um, setup in Vietnam, I think going abroad is a great opportunity too, where we have people like Mark or maybe anyone who uh, in the network of Asian partners and funders can be actually a part of that equation of going abroad, yeah. Uh, here's my last question for you. Uh, you're a professional business coach. What's the difference between a coach and a mentor? And when uh, does someone, when someone selecting a coach, what should be their criteria for picking a coach? Oh, lovely. This is one is like uh, to really like uh, a chance for me to actually. Uh, get some connection with someone, right? And even for you, uh, I actually, I I always feel that I I don't want to distinguish things much. I just feel like, okay, what is the reason behind you want to distinguish it? So that's why for me, when I actually write the books about coaching now, and I also put in there the idea of identifying mentors and coach, not about what is better. It, it's really about the reason and the meaning behind it is to actually 
by the standardization of the industries. And then you can go to look for the materials to learn and you can go to connect with the people that actually they position themselves in that mentors or coach position. So the idea is about that. It's not about what better, what not, but it's about what is working for this person in this particular situation. So uh, it is a choice also. So if you are listening to this, you are listening to this right now, you are a coach or a mentor, uh, I think we never, we should never actually underestimate if somebody is a mentor, somebody is a coach. It's really about, they actually, that's the tools for us to support others. So we, we need to tune in to this kind of main important thing, which is about helping others and mentoring, coaching the two. Even myself, actually, I had that feeling before. So I, I also like remind myself about that. Uh, so if we need to really distinguish mentoring and coaching, a coach and a mentor, I think they actually somehow share a lot of kind of common things. But uh, if I use the uh, ways that the GCI, which is a partner that we work with, uh, the what we call a grow coaching international. They have 20 years experience in coaching and with EMCC, the European standard of coaching and mentoring. Uh, the way we look at the differences is like mentoring normally comes with the informal relationship where it can last for long as people want and it doesn't have maybe a particular agenda because there's no kind of involvement of finance or money in there officially. But for a coach, they can actually say they, as a courier, they, they actually like schedule and plan in a structure where the journey, three months, six months, one year, or maybe even a month to work with, or even a, a, a session to work with the coachee to actually turn the, the desire to become actionable things and create the result. So let's say one session, okay, let me help you to have the gravity on what is your true calling in life or let me help you to actually identify what is your one important leadership value so very particular like go in the particular section or in the long run and the coach will dedicate the effort and also require the coach to dedicate the effort of money um, and action uh, so that's how they create results so it's more kind of formal setting but I believe that if we, the more we do, the more we see that actually, uh, if we do coaching and as a career, we earn money, actually even a lot of money actually. Uh, and uh, we still see that we need to combine the mentoring, the training, the consulting here and there. If we see that the coachee need that. So uh, it come back again, it's important about what is the best for the people we support. Yeah, and for the even for the mentors, if they don't need to follow the career as a coach, I think they they still apply some tools of coaching so they can help the mentees even better. Yeah. So uh, again, the differentiation, I think coaching can be as a career, as a professional package you provide, but you still combine the other tools like mentoring and training if needed, but the idea you need to inform the coachee so you can protect other coach uh, as your friend because you don't want to create the confusion. For example, your coachee say, oh, I, I coach with Mark, but I feel it, it's different from Jen. So basically the idea is that everyone will have different style and method, but if we want to inform them that I actually will coach you, but I also, this with your permission, I may mentor you because it helpful for you so I think that that's the idea and for mentors the same right we need to protect the industry to make sure the industry involved and don't get confused and uh, choose the best for um, who we support Jen, does it answer your question you, <laughs> yeah of course of course and uh, Jen thank you so much for taking the time you're so dynamic you can feel the energy coming through uh, through our zoom uh, interview today and thank you so much and, and thank you for all the uh, positive things you do for entrepreneurs uh, in Hanoi and Vietnam at large. So again, we look forward to talking to you again in the future about other books that you're writing, and we uh, wish you a great day. Thank you, Mark, and uh, everyone in uh, our Asian Founders and Funders podcast. 
And uh, I, I think with the work of Mark and the work that any one of you will do because of the podcast that Mark has been doing, uh, we all can actually create masterpiece in 2024 and the years forward. Here's to a great year. Thank you again.